Hey everybody! So, it is just about that time for uh, Hearthstone new expansion to come out, and so we've got ourselves a... Well, I'm going to talk about all the new cards because I'm weird and also want to jump on a bandwagon or something. Regardless, the idea that I have is let's look at each of these new cards and then see kind of what they might interact with and the idea of how they might operate in the current meta of the game. Um, or in the case of some cards, it's just pretty self-explanatory. They're in alphabetical order for convenience purposes on my end, so... And these are all the cards that have been released as of midnight, uh, November 21st going into the 22nd, so... Anything revealed on the 22nd or afterward has not is not part of this. So this is part one. Maybe next week I'll come back with a part two. We'll see what gets revealed over the course of the next little while. And maybe, who knows, I've got a few more days off work these days than usual. So maybe I'll put up another part later. First, let's talk about the mage legendary weapon, Alunath. Alunath is a six cost weapon with zero attack and three durability which means that if your opponent plays Harrison Jones, they get to draw three cards. But other than that, the durability is not particularly important for most of the caster weapons. And the effect is, at the end of your turn, draw three cards. This is... This is a weird one, because in terms of cost and effect, it sounds balanced on paper, but... You're almost kind of hoping your opponent destroys it, because, or that you're playing uh, Medivh, and that you drop this, like, turn six, and you get Medivh in your hand safely. So you've got, like, a lot of ammo for Medivh to work, and I'm not seeing as much value with this yet. I do like the idea that there could be something of a hand mage akin to the handlock setup that we have had for a while. Because, like, this is kind of a reliable, constant drawing of cards, but it also means that you've got to spend a lot of your mana just keeping, just continuing to throw things on the field. And you only have 30 cards. This burns your deck very quickly. So, I expect it to see play. I'm just not sure how much, and I think it's mostly going to be in regards to, like, the one turn, like, the OTK decks the Exodia-type decks, because being able to draw three cards every turn is pretty powerful in a deck like that, and opens up your deck list to potentially swap out certain draw cards, like the Cold Light uh, Oracle, which draws cards for you and your opponent, which means you're giving them cards too, so it's kind of iffy. But you're also in significant danger of overdrawing, so I don't know. We'll see how that one works out in the end. The next card to talk about is Branching Paths. This is a new Druid card. It has the effect of Choose Twice. So before anybody asks anything else, it does not work with Fandral Staghelm. Fandral says your Choose One cards have their power combined. This card says Choose Twice, which means you do not get to use Fandral for this. However, if you did get to use Fandral, it'd be really weird to see kind of how it worked. But I think Fandral would also kind of kneecap the entire point of why this card is designed the way it is. So, Branching Paths lets you choose two times out of the three options. Which means you can, for instance, draw a card and give your minions plus one attack. Or gain six armor and draw a card. Or gain six armor, give your minions plus one attack. Or you can gain 12 armor, draw two cards, or give your minions plus two attack. You have the ability to choose any of these options two times, so you can choose the same one twice. The amount of flexibility in this card makes the cost of four pretty reasonable. Um, using it as a draw two cards as a sort of arcane intellect, arcane intellect is a mage thing. Drawing cards in that capacity is a mage ability, so paying four mana to draw two cards can be the right answer in a lot of situations, but it's not specifically the thing that this card does, 
because of the flexibility, there has to be a slightly increased cost on what you'd expect this card to cost normally for just doing the effects listed. Uh, it's also slightly less powerful than Savage Roar, which I think is a 5 cost. Oh, three cost. It's slightly less powerful than Savage Roar, but Savage Roar's effect is also temporary. So, whether or not it's the best option in a given situation. And then in terms of gaining armor, the big gain armor card for Druid right now is right here, Earthen Scales. But they also have other ways of gaining armor, and this also interacts pretty well with the uh, Druid Spellstone, which we'll get into those a little later. Overall, this looks like a really fun, interesting card that will definitely see some play, and in a lot of different kinds of decks because of the potential for drawing cards for a Jade deck, or gaining armor for a Jade deck, or a big Druid deck, or giving your minions plus one attack for aggro Druid. So we'll see it in a lot of, we'll see it in a lot of different types of decks. Next, we have the Carnivorous Cube. This is interesting. Let me jump over to the generic minions, because this should look fairly familiar to a lot of people in terms of a minion that's already available in the game. Oh, I just passed it. Right here, Moat Lurker. So, Carnivorous Cube costs five, has better stats, and seems more powerful in terms of its death rattle effect. But it's that first ability that kind of rebalances the costing of it. So Mo Moat Lurker allows you to destroy any minion on the field. Just automatic six mana, destroy a thing. And its death rattle could potentially be a positive or negative effect as a regar in regards to this. Carnivorous Cube can only target your own minions. Which means that Moat Lurker, you know, if you're playing it with Rogue, for instance, you could drop this to destroy an enemy minion, then bounce it back to your hand with Shadow Step, and that minion was just gone. It wasn't coming back because of the Death Rattle, because the Death Rattle was off the field. That opens up the opportunity for cards like Kidnapper, or, yeah, I know, weird one to mention, but just figured I'd throw it out. Vanish, uh, or other cards that can bounce enemy cards back to the field, for instance or back from the field, to affect it, which can make it a bit of a risky proposition. Um, it's also a four cost, or it's also a four attack, which means that when you're playing against priests, which are a fairly popular card, fairly popular class right now, it's a little harder for them to just outright kill it for you. And they're probably not going to kill it on accident. So if you can increase its attack to 5, it actually becomes potentially even more powerful against Priest just because of uh, Anduin, but then again, there's Silence, so I don't know. Point is, this does look really neat. I like the effect, I like the potential that it has, because I ran a deck with Moat Lurker back in the day when you could run Sylvanas in Standard, and like the Death Rattle Rogue deck that I was running at the time was my strongest deck without question best deck I could do. And a big factor of that was the fact that using Shadow Step, you could kind of prepare for a turn where you'd play Sylvanas, destroy it with Moat Lurker in the same turn, and potentially, you know, just... You could just drop Sylvanas and steal an enemy's minion instantly. And it's 10 mana, but you also end up with a 3-3 on the field that as soon as it dies, oh look, there's another mind control on the field. So... But there's a lot of potential for this as well. Uh, the big aspect of it, again, is to work with Death Rattle minions or minions with aura effects like um, Sorcerer's Apprentice or Apprentice, oh, one second. such as the, yeah, Sorcerer's Apprentice, or even things like Pyros or Cult Sorcerer. You know, things like spell damage minions. There are so many minions that have benefits from just being on the field that they give you that this 
is a very powerful option. And of course there's <laughs> the dream right here. <laughs> Two Tyrians. And you get the Ashbringer when this activates. It's even crazier. So, uh, it's a good card in concept. It'll be interesting to see how it gets played. I don't know how it interacts with everything so far in the current setup for the expansion, but anyway, we are on to what is one of the more talked about elements of the current expansion, alongside legendary weapons, is Rogue Secrets. So, giving Rogue's Secrets kind of works just automatically because Hallucination, Swashburglar, uh, let's see, where's the... Under City Huckster, and any number of other cards just give you access to cards from your opponent's setup, from your opponent's hand anyway. So, rogues have been playing secrets for years. So, <laughs> well, not year. Actually, wait, when did, when did, uh, Old Gods come out? Yeah, about two years ago or something. So, yeah, rogues have been playing secrets for years. So to give them actual secrets is a pretty neat idea, and apparently they were already a secret class in the early days of the game, but, you know, either way. Uh, the effect of this one, two mana, all rogue secrets will be two mana, there's going to be three secrets, uh, we've only seen two so far. Um, this one, Cheat Death, is akin to the Paladin secret of Getaway Kodo, when a friendly minion dies, return it to your hand. But, for that one additional mana, you get the added bonus of it being shadow-stepped back to your hand, so it costs two less the next time you want to play it. Which is pretty great. Additionally, not only does this work help just in general summoning, reducing the mana cost of your minions also facilitates combo cards more effectively. The secret is not particularly expensive, so you can use it to activate combo cards later in the game. I mean, seven mana to drop this and the uh, Slayer, Bilespine Slayer. That's pretty great, actually. <laughs> That's really quite good in terms of the potential that exists there, because then you have a three mana Bilespine Slayer turn eight, and you can play it along with all your five cost minions and... Like, uh, um, well, Shadowcaster, I guess. It, I don't even, I'm trying to think of a good five cost rogue minion and I'm not gonna, I'm not getting one right off the top of my head. Uh, the five cost dragon neutral, we all love and hate very much, but the potential here is pretty obvious. You can use it for battle cry minions. You can use it for any minion, really. Um. Works pretty well with Plague Scientist, which conveniently is right here. Excruciating pain means it's working. And yeah, there's a lot of potential for just benefiting from being able to bring your minions back to your hand and have them cost less the next time you play them. So yeah, it's a... Uh, and since the minion does die, I believe it still... Yeah, since the minion dies, it still activates a death rattle. So, the card we just saw, the ooze that copies, that allows you to play two copies of another thing, that works pretty well too. So, yeah, there's your possibilities. Crushing walls destroy your opponent's left and right most minions. So, hunter cards, in terms of removal, uh, they have some interesting options. Some random damage, one damage, two damage. Reduce something's health to one. You know, their traps and tricks like that. Thing is, Hunter actually does have a decent number of removal options. It's just a question of how many of them are actually really all that useful. Like, you'll notice a lot of these. Like, Grievous Bite, Toxic Arrow... A lot of these cards have either other effects or, like, their damage is fairly low. And when you start getting into the higher damage potential removal cards that exist for Hunter, a lot of them are more randomized or very specialized. Like, 
you know, from this point forward, most of them are, you know, a bit different and odd. And some of these are going away, like Dispatch Kodo and whatnot. So I think it's an interesting idea for a, for a Hunter removal card, but... Like, Explosive Shot is a classic card, and it'll probably do... Like, the value of being able to destroy two minions is good. And seven mana to just outright destroy two minions is pretty neat. I'm not entirely sure if this will see play just because of the current setup for Hunter being faster, but there are a lot of other Hunter cards that have been revealed so far that are pushing Hunter in the direction of trying to say, hey... Let's try this slightly slower way of playing. Let's try this secret-based, death rattle-based kind of hunter system, and we'll go over some of those cards in a little while. But it's possible that Cushing Walls, or Cushing Walls, will uh, be of some use in the future. So, <laughs> Cushing Walls. This is the uh, still like the official artwork I find on places like uh, Hearthpwn right now is misspelled i do hope that's actually or maybe it's not maybe i'm just maybe i just don't know what that word is maybe that is a word that means crushing at times well whatever so the next one set in our list is dragon soul which if you can't tell by the current thing dragon priest is kind of a thing i really love but uh well i've got other Card. I've got other things on this channel to point out. Dragon Priest is a type of card. Or is a Breeze type that I love. And the effect is actually not nearly as bad as it might appear on the surface. Essentially, you cast three spells, you summon a 5-5 five, five dragon. That by itself is already impressive. It becomes significantly more impressive if, for instance, you happen to have Lyra. Or, you know, Shadow... Shadow Visions, is it? Yeah, Shadow Visions, or even cheap cards like Power Word Shield, Divine Spirit, Pint Size Potion, Potion of Madness. There's all sorts of low-cost Priest cards right now, and there's even more that are going to be coming down the line because there will always be more low-cost Priest cards. Now, the fact that it has to be spells does slightly limit its potential. Very slightly. The fact that it's three cost and you can just kind of have it on the field and be like, I don't really need to use this, but it's here, is a nice potential bonus and makes it actually somewhat worthwhile even just to kind of splash into priest decks that are more oriented around spell casting, like the Kazakis, like uh, Razakis Priest or the Divine Spirit uh, OTK Priest. And even Dragon Priest currently has a, uses a lot of cards. Like, all my Dragon Priest decks use Thought Steel, and there's all sorts of cards and lets you copy enemy, car, enemy spells and other such things that mean that you'll usually have access to a lot of spell options in the game. So, combined with something like Priest of the Feast, it gives you the option to survive a ton of stuff from your opponent. So... I think there's a lot more potential here just because of the fact that you can kind of just set it and forget it. And, oh, look, I have the spells to use it. Okay, sure, why not? Let's just, let's get another dragon on the field. And then, of course, it's a dragon, so it's not affected by the dragon fire potion. So that's, it's a pretty neat option. Uh, I think it will see play. I don't think it'll necessarily see a ton of play, but... If anything, I think it might be a surprise inclusion in the Razakis decks, um, similar to how Marin is. And spoiler warning, Marin's already in the game, so I'm not putting him in this preview commentary. We've seen how he works right now, and he's a lot of fun to play. I use him in my Dragon Priest, in my budget Dragon Priest deck, since being a free legendary, similar to Cthulhu, he costs nothing. So, anyway. Next, we have the Dry Gulch Jailer. This is a Paladin card built around the Silverhand Recruits. We have cards like Lost in the Jungle, which give us more Silverhand Recruits, and Smuggler's Run, which works well with this. Uh, let's see, we have. There's more in. There's more in there. Makes Dark Conviction seem even more worthwhile. 
you've got Sword of Justice works with it. Steward of Darkshire. And of course all your buffing cards. But here's the big one I wanted to point to. Uh, Life Use Stegadon. Coming out, Johnston. I think those horns are quite fetching on you. The Light Fuse Stegadon is a card that you can see having value, but it's one of those things where you're not entirely sure if you've got enough value for it yet. And I think the Dry Gulch Jailer adds the potential for that to actually work out pretty well. There's another Silverhand Recruit card in the set currently. Standing Against Darkness is currently in the set, which is pretty interesting to see with the other card. I think the main point that's valuable about this is that it adds them to your hand, which opens up the opportunity for hand buff cards, which unfortunately are kind of going away after uh, the next standard rotation in terms of standard set, but I mean in wild that's a thing that'll continue to exist. But like right now, if you're going to build a budget deck for Paladin, hand buff is probably one of your big options for that. So, um, I see a lot of potential with this card, but as the game currently sits, I'm not sure how it's going to play out. And I think it, I think it may have more to do with how much more popular AOE spells and stuff become over time. So... And, I mean, there's still Murlocs for Paladins to use for low-cost Swarming the Field type decks, so I'm not really sure yet. I think the most potential this has is in hand buff, and we'll see. Uh, it also would work pretty well with uh, Hobgoblin in Wild, so Hobgoblin decks might be a thing in Wild at some point in the near future, who knows? We'll see. Uh, there are plenty of Silverhand Recruit cards that work with that too, just like the ones I already showed you. So, yeah, we'll see how this plays out in the future. Duskbreaker. So, remember what I said about Dragon Priest? <laughs> yeah. What I love about this card the most is the sheer amount of potential it has. Just, if you're holding a dragon, deal 3 damage to all other minions. It's a 4 cost, 3-3. Three, three. With that effect, that cost is really quite good. Arguably too good in terms of the value of a 3 damage board clear on turn 4, like that, that'll destroy a lot of aggro setups. Especially like Shaman and Druid aggro may not necessarily have all of what they need on the field at that time to make this uh, not, to make the, to negate the power of this card. Um, it affects all other minions, so if your opponents are playing dragon cards, you can still hit them with this. Um, it's situational because they're requiring you to hold a dragon, but again, Dragon Priest will use that. But the thing that really, really makes me interested is it's rare, which means that a lot of players will have easy access to this card. As you see, it's like, as I've shown on the channel here, Dragon Priest is one of those card types that actually can work on a budget level, and... This can essentially replace the uh, potion, the potion summoning minion. One second, Cabal Chemist, I believe it is. Yeah, this can replace the Cabal Chemist, which I toss into the deck usually as, hey, I might get a uh, Dragon Fire or can I have Polymorph Potion? It could be anything, even a Polymorph Potion. Um. But yeah, it's, the potential there is pretty high, and Duskbreaker, like, when this card was revealed, I was watching the live stream at that point, and the chat went freaking nuts over this card. Like, everyone immediately recognized that this card almost by itself opens up a bunch of new options for Dragon Priest, so... And allows them to fight against aggro decks, which is something Dragon Priest as more of a mid-range kind of deck, has trouble doing. So this is a really nice card to have on hand, and I really enjoy it. Next we have the Feral Gibberer, a card that I, I guarantee is getting undervalued by nearly everyone at this point. 
although I don't know by how much. And again, it really does come down to our good friend, Hand Buffs McGillicuddy. And yeah, this is currently at its current situation, I'd say only hand buff setups and maybe rogues could really use this as is. Just because, hey, I've got this one mana minion and I hit your face with it. Oh, I've now got a one mana minion I can use to trigger combos later. And I can keep adding these minions to my hand to make sure that I can trigger my combo cards anytime I need to. And that is one of the things that I have an issue with with my current with my uh, rogue control spell thief deck is this idea of having uh, cards to combo with. So, but again, I think its main value comes from hand buff, and I'm not really sure it's gonna be anywhere near as used as I really wish it was. But we'll see. We'll see. I mean, we'll just have to see how this plays out. And at this point, I'm not sure it has what it takes, but maybe I'm wrong on that one. Gather your party. Recruit a minion. Pretty self-explanatory. Uh, oh, right. We haven't mentioned what Recruit does. Recruit basically pulls the Serge effect of pull a minion straight out of your deck and put it on the field. It doesn't copy the minion, it just summons it straight away. So for six mana, you too can recruit a Unzoth's first mate. <laughs> Seriously, the, the randomness swing of this card, unless you build your deck very specifically for it, is really terrible for most of the uh, warrior decks that I've seen. But I guarantee you someone will find out a way, find a way of using this with like Leroy Jenkins and sudden genesis and some weird combination of stuff to like otk somebody so just wait until the better deck crafters figure this one out because i don't have any idea how to really quantify it guild recruiter recruits a minion that costs four or less a five mana two four I think the value here is when you build a deck that really does capitalize on the particulars of this card to a point, but then again, like, unless you're putting in, like, Tar Creepers and stuff and not very many low-cost minions, this is basically pay five mana, get two four in stats plus some other thing, which may be a good option, maybe not. Who knows? Uh, it might be a two-one... Murloc with charge. It might be a five five that dam that does five damage to your face every time you summon a minion. <laughs> like there is some potential. I think the deck that might have the most potential with this is probably the Warlock, just because of their lower costed discard discard cards. So or self damaging cards like the Imp or the. Uh, let's jump in there. Things like. The Lakari Fellhound, or the uh, Fogard Succubus. So I think this is almost kind of a Warlock card at this point, because I think there's a lot of potential for Warlocks. I mean, even randomly pulling this out of your deck is pretty great. I mean, Darkshire Librarian... I can see this being used in Warlock decks just because the actual potential value of being able to pull, like, pay 5 mana, get 5-6 of stats. That's about, on, that's about on par with standard stat line. It's also a 4 health minion, which makes it a little harder to remove cheaply. So, we'll actually, we'll have to see how this plays out. I think Warlock is the deck that will play this. And actually play it well, if anyone does. And considering the number of demons that are low-costed with these upper stats, it opens up a lot of potential for some crazy shenanigans with Blood Reaver. So, we'll see how it plays out. I I think this card might be a little underwhelming in its initial appearance, but I can already see some real power and potential here with Orlock in particular. So, we'll see. 
the lesser Jasper Spellstone. Okay, so the Spellstone cards are a new set of cards. We currently have had three of them revealed. I would imagine each class will have one. Uh, they all appear to be rare in their rarity, so it'll be useful for budget options. But what they are is they have a cost and an effect, and the cost is balanced toward, I believe, their initial effect more than the other two effects. Which definitely seems to be the case in the two best examples of this. Well, I say two best. This is the one really good example right now that we have. The other two are powerful, but way more situational. So, or one of them is really situational. The other one may not be as good in practice as it sounds on paper, but we'll see. Uh, Lesser Jasper Spellstone. The effect is when you gain... It deals two damage to a minion if you play it as is. However, if you gain three armor, you get an upgraded version, which is the Jasper Spellstone that does four damage to a minion. And then if you gain three more armor, and you play a, and then I'll play a bigger minion, uh, you gain the ability to do six damage to a minion. Now, it effectively starts off as a de facto arcane shot for Druid, which... Not gonna lie, that right away got me interested in saying, this card's already good enough without the armor gain specific bonuses. It's already usable for lower level players as an effective, low cost, early game removal. And that is kind of a thing Druid struggles with. Like, they got Moonfire, they've got things like Claw. But in terms of things that are clearly just straight remove destroy minion you got naturalize which causes your opponent to draw two cards which can be pretty detrimental because giving your opponent a card advantage to destroy something really early in the game could set you back quite a bit uh wrath is the big removal is the big low cost removal card that gets used a lot for druid and it's three damage to a minion for two mana so this is already out cost again in terms of its direct value, but Wrath also has that flexibility. Thing is, though, it takes at absolute most three turns to gain that three armor if you're using your hero power as much as possible. So by turn four, you can spend on your hero power and then have enough mana to do this and any other one car cost card. So... You know, you can have this up to a 4 damage to a minion pretty quickly. Throw in cards like the, uh, oh, where is it? Feral Rage, which might just give you, which is like 3 mana, upgrade all the way, possibly. Um, it kind of makes Feral Rage a valuable tool for this to piggyback off of, assuming that it can upgrade twice at, in one move, which I'm not sure it can. So that'll be an interesting er interaction to see. And I don't think we've actually seen that yet, is the idea of can a card upgrade twice in one action? And like one of them, it's not a question of whether or not that's possible because you really can't do the thing that activates it twice as a single action. So. Uh, we'll see how they play out, but I do really think this is already a good enough card just by itself, and the upgrades just make it so much better. So I, I guarantee this will see some play. I'm not sure how much play, but I think it'll see more play after the rotation, since there will be more space after getting rid of, say, the Jade Blossoms and Mire, uh, Mire Keepers. So, because like we'll be losing a bit of mana ramp. You'll need more options early game to really make sure that you have the ability to survive long enough. And early game removal like a Lesser Jasper Spellstone can be a key factor in that. Katharina Winterwisp. This is the only hunter card with the recruit ability. It is the hunter legendary minion. And we'll have a hunter legendary weapon at some point. Uh... <laughs> The joke being being Thunder Fury. We'll see if that turns out to be true. Um, Katharina Wisp, Winter Wisp has the Battlecry and Death Rattle element, so that's already pretty cool. 
Eight mana, six, six. Not all that impressive with stats, but recruit a beast. So, say, for instance, you happen to have uh, this guy in your deck. And he's the only beast in your deck. Or he is joined by his companions, uh, Thing 2 and Thing 1. Well, you have an incredible opportunity to just pull a 7-mana minion straight from your deck that hits your opponent right in the nose. Just booped right in the nose. I mean, the potential value of this card is already incredibly obvious, but it's the time that it takes to actually get it into the field that people are freaking out about a little. Ooh, look, Ultra Sword. And I think it might be that a lot of the... Like, a lot of the idea is that Hunter right now is an aggressive deck, and it has been forever. But there have also been Secret Hunters. Essentially forever. Like, Hunter is also one of those good budget decks, so building off of that is pretty cool. This actually offers a possibility for a higher cost hunter deck with things like Abominable Bowman, uh, Call of the Wild. We'll, I'll explain later why I mentioned Call of the Wild specifically, as well as the Cushing Wall, as well as the Cushing Walls. Uh, we'll just have to see how it plays out in the end. But I think there's a lot of potential for this card. Even more potential if you mix it up with things like Barns or other cards that can summon stuff from your deck. So we'll see. I like it. I have high hopes. I'm not sure how it'll play out, but I want to see it work. Kobold Illusionist. Summon a 1-1 copy of a minion from your hand as a death rattle. I don't think you just get to pick which one. Pretty sure it's randomly selected. But the obvious power here is pretty obvious. It's a rogue card, so it fits right in with rogue doing stuff like illusion, like shadow step, the shadow peoples. And, yeah. Uh, I, there's really not too much to say about this one. This one's pretty straightforward. It's a pretty good option. Uh, it summons the card from your hand, but it's not playing the card, so... And no battle cry, as per usual. But hey, you might get a... You might get a Lotus Assassin. That'll do nothing for you. And the fact that it's a 1-1 copy is what makes it pretty particular. Uh, Malgos... Rogue may be coming back in vogue pretty soon. We'll see. Level up. This is the other Silver Hand Recruit card I mentioned. And I think it's a little overcosted. I think it's one over the cost that would actually make it really worth building a deck around. But I can still see the value of it. And a lot of that has to do, again, with the hand buff and cards like the... Uh, Stegadon. I think there's some real potential for Silver Hand Recruits to be a subtype again, because they've they've played around with this as a subtype for a long time. Uh, back in Argent Tournament. Had Muster for Battle, Warhorse Trainer. Uh, Vine Cleaver, Quartermaster, which did almost the same thing for the same price, but also added a body to the field and didn't give them taunt. So, they've been playing around with the idea of these cards for quite some time, and I think maybe they're getting their handle on it. Like, they've got a lot of summon Silver Hand Recruits cards right now already. So we've got Standing in Darkness, Vine Cleaver, Lost in the Jungle. Life you stake it on is the buff. It's the only major buff to them right now. Uh, it'll be interesting to see more buffs if there's another buff set in this uh, thing. Buff, buff, buff frog. Um, so we'll see how this plays out. I have high enough hopes for it. Now there's Lesser Mithril, Sp Mithril Spellstone. This was the other Spellstone card that I really like, but that I'm not entirely sure how well it's going to work. And... Okay, so it's just the idea of paying 7 mana to summon 5-5s five is kind of weird, but not impossible to benefit from. Now, the effect upgrades from equipping a weapon, which means, for instance, you can do it for 1 mana here, or 1 mana here, or however many this does, 
Or, uh... Where's the two mana weapon? Oh, here's the two mana war axe. And the blood razor, there's all sorts of options for that. So having it in your hand and then playing a a weapon before this would be on curve is not all that difficult. And just the regular mithril spellstone, seven mana for two five fives, is already pretty decent. It's actually a pretty solid option. If you can somehow manage to get two weapons out before you would play this on curve, it's fantastic. But again, that brings up the important... But that brings up a bit of a weakness of spellstones that I hadn't mentioned yet. For the upgrade effect to happen, the spellstone must be in your hand. I'm... That's obvious, I would imagine, but... Like, there are cards that are affected while they're still in your deck, so... This is, this has to be in your hand, which means it takes up a hand slot. It takes up one of the card, one of the nine, one of the ten spaces in your hand you can have cards in. It takes up one of your draws earlier in the game to get it, and you just have to hold it and hope and wait and get what you need to hope that you can actually play this at its full potential. Because if you play this on turn seven or even six, if you have the coin and you get the three golems, you definitely got cost benefit. You definitely got a good value out of that. And even if it ends up being, you know, fairly minor as an effect, it's still a pretty decent value option in terms of what you can get out of it. But unless you're upgrading it at least once before you play it, and if you're drawing it late game, you're probably not doing that, then... Uh, it's this is the one I'm iffy on because I'm not sure that summoning the five fives is a big enough benefit. I mean, yeah, it's out of flame strike range. Uh, there is not as many things that can deal with that many minions in that respect, other than of course the dragon fire potion, and that is going away with the next rotation. I'm just wondering what how well it's going to work in the long run. So I have high hopes for it, but I'm not necessarily seeing the seeing it being a huge value card yet. We'll see how it plays out in the future. Again. Rin the First Disciple. Okay, so this card is already something of a meme. Uh, it's the 35... It's like the 36 mana destroy your opponent's... The 41 mana card that destroys your opponent's deck. <laughs> because you play it, and it dies, and it has to die first, which is my biggest issue with it, because the death rattle... Why is it a death rattle instead of a battle cry? Like, if this were a battle cry, it'd see more play. I guarantee it'd see more play if it was a battle cry, because the taunt would actually allow you the more... A little bit more time potentially to play it but it's a death rattle it has one of the most interesting effects after you play each of these seals which summons bigger and bigger demons once again providing uh potential fodder for our dear friend blood reaver goldan the other effect is after you get the last demon which costs 10 to play i think not remembering entirely accurate off the top of my head, but I think it costs 10 to play it. Uh, it destroys your opponent's deck. Now, yeah, Warlocks have gotten cards recently that have been all about destroying what your opponent has in their deck or making them discard cards or, like... Uh, like, Gnome Veratu is a lot of fun, but this is just, it's a really neat effect. It's just not feasible. It, it just, it just isn't. You'll see this win occasional games against, like, somebody really unlucky playing a control deck, or... Like, it just is not viable right now. There might be a card that comes out soon that makes this a better that makes this an option but right now it just is not viable as is i don't think 
Um, one of the things that does help, however, is Blood Bloom. This allows you to pay health instead of mana to play some of the seal cards, which can be a big help. But Blood Bloom and it's, uh, Blood Bloom and Cho'Gall by themselves do not do the job enough. It just it isn't enough. So it's such a cool idea, and I love it so much. And it's also essentially impossible to rely on. And it's sad how many times Warlock has had that happen recently. I'm so happy that Gablittery Rigoldan turned out to be as good as it is. So, because, like, I've been disappointed by the quest. This is disappointing. It's... I still want to make a deck with this card. <laughs> I still want to make a deck with this card so bad. So, I still want it. It's just not going to be a big win rate deck, so... Rummaging Kobold, we're getting close to the end. Sorry about how long this video is. Um, Battlecry, return one of your destroyed weapons to your hand. That's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, weapon classes work pretty well with it, and which is now all classes because of the legendary weapons. But, you know, just the idea of like, oh, well, I'm going to splash in Harrison Jones to destroy your legendary weapon. Oh, yeah, well, I'm going to play Rummaging Kobold to get the weapon back. So... You know, stick out tongue and make annoying childish noises. The Rune Spear. This is the Shaman weapon. Anybody noticing yet that the weapons don't seem all that impressive by them? That the legendary weapons seem kind of mediocre in comparison to the Death Knights, which all looked pretty amazing pretty much from day one? Uh, okay, so to be fair, I think this is getting undervalued significantly. And they even discussed this. This one came up in the live stream, and the designer that was sitting there with Brian talked about the idea of, you know, we looked at shaman cards and we and we noticed that a lot of them actually don't target things. So a lot of the good, like we've got Totemic Might, which is basically useless. Uh, you've got Evolve. You've got Devolve. You've got. Uh, Forked Lightning, Ice Fishing, Maelstrom Portal, Feral Spirit, Lightning Storm, Volcano, Avalanche, um, Bloodlust, Hex. Oh, that could go terribly wrong now that I think about it. <laughs> that could go so horribly wrong. Uh, Tidal Surge. You're casting a spell, so it works with this card too, which I think is... Like, I really, I really like this card, and I have tried to build a deck that actually uses it, but... I guess the point I'm trying to make... Volcano. Okay, no. The point I'm trying to make with this is... I think this is being undervalued because of its incredibly high cost. The thing is, it has an attack to it. Shamans are a weapon class, which means you can play this, attack, and use its effect immediately. Which is not something you can say for a lot of other high-cost uh, weapons with effects. So, like, you play Medivh, that's usually your turn in terms of Medivh's ability. Uh, you don't necessarily get any value out of Atiash, and that's going to be an even bigger deal now that so many people are going to have Harrison Jones. Which I think I actually crafted one of those. When, yeah, I... I crafted this as soon as the reveal came up with the legendary weapons. It's This card is going to appear a lot in the upcoming meta if the weapons are all really worthwhile. This might be the first of the weapons that we've seen that I think kind of deserves the Harrison Jones treatment. Because letting your opponent keep this on the board is terrifying. Because it allows for them to basically get free control options and free minion buffs and whatnot. Provided they don't roll extremely low on their probability. And as the sets rotate and we move into the next uh, standard block, this is going to be either significantly more powerful or it's going to get nerfed. Entirely based on what kinds of spells they add, considering... 
let's go ahead and hit up the shaman cards from, say, uh, Old Gods. Evolve, t Tribal Fusion, Stormcrack, Going Away. Um, Karazhan, Maelstrom Portal. That one's actually a nerf for it going away. Devolve, Call the Finishers, Jade Lightning, all the Jade cards going away. So we're going to be down to like the base set cards, like Classic and Basic, and Ungoro, and there's going to be a lot fewer useless potential options. There's going to be some higher risk options, but not as many completely useless ones, aside from potentially Ice Fishing and the Totemic Might. So, like, I think there's some potential here. I think it's way undervalued for people, but I do have to say I think it would be better if it cost seven. If it cost seven, it would be way more playable, and I think it would be way more worthwhile. So, we'll see. Okay, so here's the other Shaman card. This one, I think, is not being undervalued. <laughs> And it works pretty well with this, obviously. Uh, works really well with Snow Fury Giant, considering that you can overload 11 mana crystals over the game to upgrade this to its full potential, and then, oh look, turn 7, drop this, and get 4 Snow Fury Giants, considering you just played one for free. It works well with this card. Like, the potential for getting this up to its higher level is not too bad. Overloading three mana crystals is pretty easy to do. There are some minions that do it outright, and then there are, you know... Everyone's favorite, four mana seven seven. The four mana seven seven. It's... I just wonder how valuable this is going to be in the long run, just because, like, you can only play it on turn seven, or later... Unless you have the coin, because, like, there's not much mana acceleration in the realm of shamans. Although, there is the Lotus dude. It's a five-coster. There are the Lotus agents, which can access druid cards and rogue cards. So it's possible you could get a coin or innervate from those. So, who knows. You might be able to accelerate your mana a little bit with something like this, but, I don't know. It's probably not going to be much val all that valuable at this point. I think there's a lot of power here, and there's a lot of power particularly for summoning, say, uh... Oh, look! Four Ysera's! Four Lich Kings! Eh, four Deathwings, yeah, that would do it. <laughs> that would do it! Four Cthulhu's! But again, these are really high-cost cards that you have to get onto the field somehow. So, like, I'm not really sure how well this is going to work in the end. <laughs> Cherish Devil's Sword. I think it all kind of depends on what you can get onto the field to use this with. So, we'll see how that plays out in the future, but I'm just not seeing as much value with this. I mean, low-cost spell damage minions might actually be one of the better ways of using this. Using some of those few targeted damage cards to hit your opponent in the face with, like, lightning bolts that do seven damage and pop. So, we'll see. Probably not all that great, though. Not a fan, is the point I'm trying to make here. Seeping Oozling. Another hunter card built around Death Rattle. Oh, What's that? What was that? What was that one we had earlier? The eight mana six six that when it's death rattle, recruits a minion, recruits a beast, recruits thing two, thing one and thing two. Hmm. Now that sounds like an interesting idea. Yeah, death rattle for hunter has been a thing for a little while. Like people have been trying to mess around with it for quite some time, and there's a lot of nice cards that have come out recently for it. We'll see how well this plays out in the end. But I like this card. I really do like the potential that it has, and... Huh. Seems like he actually did take Candle. But there's not too much to say about it. There's a lot of potential here. I like it. We'll see what happens. Spiteful Summoner. The ticking abomination of this set in terms of its, uh... 
the issue of it not being revealed all that quickly. Spiteful Summoner. Reveals a spell from your deck. Summon a random minion at the same cost. Like, uh... It's a six mana do the effect of Medivh's thing without actually playing the spell. Do the effect of Atiyash without actually playing the spell. There's some real power there. There's a lot of power in terms of high cost uh, spells being useful. I can imagine seeing... Like, in regards to the spell stones I just mentioned, it seems that they're actually putting out a decent number of higher cost spells in this set. So we've got those big spell stones, we've got Cushing Walls, we've got, like, and we've already got things like Nether Portal, or Twisting Nether, that's it. And Doom... We ran out of space for Doom. But just generally speaking, in terms of like really high cost spells, got Wisps, Ultimate, Call the Wild. Oh, look! It reveals Call the Wild, the Summon's King Crush. Mage. Mage could have a field day with this. Firelands portals get played all the time in mage decks. There's Flame Strike, Pyroblast. I mean, yeah, it's just ridiculous. Mages could really benefit from it. Uh, Paladins could get Lay on Hands, but it's always going for those higher cost things. For instance, I don't think Priest benefits nearly as much from this because they don't have as many higher cost spells. They're good ones. They're really good, viable, higher cost spells. But, like, most of Priest deck spells are lower cost, so you're not getting as good of minions, generally speaking. Because the thing about summoning a random minion at cost is there are great minions with powerful effects across the entire spectrum of Hearthstone. But when it comes down to it, if you have to just pull a minion based entirely on cost, you usually want to go for a higher cost just because of stats. So that's where the real value judgment comes in. Because like, hey look, and again, it's also summon a random minion, which means it can be any class's minions. So you have a, uh, the hunter has called a wild in the deck, might summon obsidian statue. And for a hunter to have Obsidian Statue can completely change the overall structure of the game, especially on turn 6 or turn 5 with uh, Coin. I mean, it's it's ridiculous how much potential this card has to high roll your way into a really, really terrifying situation for your opponent. But it all depends on the class using it, and I think a lot... There are some specific classes that will really benefit from using this. I think Warlock and Mage obviously have a lot of value already built in for this card. Uh, whereas some other classes are going to have more trouble really benefiting from it. I think Hunter also has a surprising amount of value built into this card. Just because Hunter spells tend to be kind of over Tend to be in the upper mid-range of cost. So they could get some decent options out of it too. We'll just have to see. I, I keep saying that. I like the card, and I'm sure somebody will build a deck that uses it. It's just a question of, will that deck absolutely dominate the meta? And I'm guessing the answer is no. But it's still a fun card to play with, and I still really like the idea. And I think there's a lot of potential for it to be really swingy. Our, and of course it's inevitable. We have Sudden Betrayal. Uh, when a minion attacks your hero, instead it attacks one of its, one of its neighbors. Uh, if there is no neighbor on the board, I believe that that effect does not go off. So the secret doesn't actually trigger in that situation, I don't think. So, this one's pretty straightforward. It's misdirect, but with a more specifically obvious target. It's misdirect, but it only targets one of two specific enemies, minions on the field at most. 
and it's also really kind of easier to counter out of the various out of the mage secrets so i think this one's the less powerful rogue secret i just said mage secret this one's the less powerful of the two we've seen so far but it's still a really neat option and i like it it's just i think cheat death is more generally powerful in terms of the potential that it has access to so i mean if you're only going to go with one or the other i'd say cheat death out of the two twig of the world tree people were underwhelmed by this one at first um it's a four mana it's the legendary druid weapon four mana one attack five durability death rattle gain 10 mana crystals okay so first of all as anybody who has gone crazy over this card points out pretty much universally oh look death rattle gain 10 mana crystals gain 10 full permanent mana crystals so turn four then play something to figure out a way of getting rid of it immediately and oh look boom 10 mana crystals way faster than your opponent it's a much better four cost option for that than the other druid four cost option for that which was uh let's see that was what we would go to uh yeah astral communion this was something of a uh pre-made nerf for yog saron <laughs> considering how many times i've seen this come up in people's gameplay with yog just saying oh look here's your hand going away have fun with that so yeah there's a lot of potential there with the whole 10 mana crystal thing but at its at its core i think its main value is going to really shine after the next rotation because we're losing jade blossom in the next rotation and we're losing mire keeper in the next rotation and those two cards get played a lot we're going back to the base acceleration and remember that innervate got nerfed as well so it's only doing one mana instead of the uh two this means that this card is going to be way more valuable just on the face of it now the durability effect here is where this really does come into play i'm not sure how many cards exist to let you just get rid of your own durability uh definitely not much in the way of druid but again the real value comes from it's like and it's true power right now mostly seems to lie in playing it and then using potentially uh medivh drop medivh then drop kun refresh your mana crystals then drop ultimate infestation get another 10 mana minion on the field and just destroy your opponent with overwhelming force it's it's the dream ability it's the dream ability to use with this right now and two of those cards are going away when the next uh, expansion comes around so again it depends on if there will be any mechanism or tech card to be able to destroy your own weapon for some effect because the five durability thing its main benefit at this point is not the gaining 10 mana crystals to accelerate but gaining 10 mana crystals to recharge because again you just gain the mana crystals i think you gain them and refresh them similar to uh nourish see when you gain two mana crystals from nourish they're full and you gain full mana crystals even if you already have 10 you'll still gain two you'll refill two mana crystals so i think that's how it works uh if that is how it works the way that this card is going to be used is very different from the way people are necessarily thinking of it right now but it's pretty neat and i really like the idea and i'm really hopeful for the future on it unidentified elixir uh there's a new type of card called unidentified cards the unidentified elixir is the first of these that's been released is a three cost priest buff card gives a minion plus two plus two gains a bonus effect in your hand and here's what those bonus effects are just expand this a bit 
Life Steal. Summon a 1 1 copy of it. Return the minion to your hand as a death rattle. Divine Shield. Essentially, this is a. It's a neat little buff card option, but. Like, for its cost? I don't know. Right now, I'm not seeing it being nearly as valuable, but we will see soon, and the abil and the whole Dragon Soul thing, making playing spells better, is pretty neat. But right now, Priest still has, like, Tentacles, Divine Spirit, Inner Fire. I mean, the minions that just increase health so that Inner Fire can be stronger. So I'm not sure we actually have this at its full potential yet, but I think the Life Steal, Divine Shield, the Auto Res type things, those give this a lot more value to the potential that it has. And summoning an extra copy of a powerful minion like Ysera, I think it's those secondary effects that will really decide how good this card can be at any given time. They're all costed well, so like it's all a good cost uh, card setup, but I'm just not sure how well it's going to play out in the end. So, yeah. This one's pretty great. <laughs> okay, this is a pretty neat little uh, trap. Wandering monster. When your enemy attacks a hero, summon a devil sore egg as the new target. <laughs> summon a death speaker as the new target. Summon a... Emperor Cobra is the new target. <laughs> Summon a Harvest Golem is the... See, the thing is, there's a lot of nice level 3... A lot of nice 3-cost minions. Hmm. Humongous ra Razor Leaf. So... Like, the value of this card is actually pretty straightforward. It's a pretty randomized card. It's not clear if you'll actually get much of a benefit out of it for the individual situation. But the point... The point is that it provides additional early game defense. So it makes that death rattle secret type deck thing that we were talking about earlier more of a reasonable option. So I don't expect us to see as much play just in random decks, but in secret decks, yeah, I expect it to show up. I believe this is our last one, Zola the Gorgon. It's a copy a minion on the field and add the copy of that minion to your hand. But it's a shiny copy. All joking aside, though, three cost, two, two, with the ability to just give you an extra copy of a minion from the board, from your field to the hand. Pretty solid. This will see play. It's a pretty solid card. Uh, it won't see. It'll see play in some classes more than others, Rogue, and uh, any class that really relies on its battle cries and whatnot. I think Shaman will probably see, this will probably see some play in Shaman too, just because of the idea of like, oh, let's, let's grab an extra copy of our uh, Manatide Totem, or our Flame Tongue Totem, or... No, you know, there's more stuff in there. Point is, pretty obvious which value will... Car like, the value of this card is fairly straightforward. And, uh... That should be about it. Because, uh... The first new reveal has, ha has just happened. So I just uh, saw that. Yeah, we'll definitely talk about those, uh, the new cards later. But for now, these are the cards that are coming out that are not already out, like Marin. And that's it for today's uh, video. I know it's not necessarily what I usually do, but I just wanted to go ahead and uh, jump on the bandwagon of talking about the next set of Hearthstone. It's looking really interesting and really fun, and I like a lot of the directions that they're trying to go with the different, uh, the different types of classes and gameplay so thanks for watching and i'll be back again in the future with another one of these videos see ya